Hey everybody, I am Brady Briggs here for another episode of The Combat Logic, and today I want to recap UFC 271 as well as UFC Vegas 48 and touch on Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship Knuckle Mania 2 as well as Bellator 274. Now, I wasn't able to watch Bellator, but I got a couple results I can go over with you. So, I missed some of the earlier fights of the 271 card. I was happy to see that Maxime Grishin beat William Knight, considering William Knight um, had the biggest weight miss in UFC history leading up to the fight, so much so that his opponent had to change because of it. Douglas Silva de Andrade submitted Sergey Morozov, a former M1 Challenge champion, or M1 Global champion. No, this was really impressive, and there is something that I see reoccurring it's a recurring issue with Sergey Morozov. He's such a good fighter, but his last three losses, despite who they're to, Mavzar Evloev, Umar Nurmagomedov, and Douglas Silva de Andrade, he has been rear naked choked in all three of those defeats, all three of his most recent defeats. And he went unconscious in all three of them as well. He didn't tap in any of them, but he got rear naked choked and he very clearly has a problem of getting his back taken. I would really like to see him improve that because other than that, he is a very, very solid fighter. Um, it's good to see Dayan Draj get a good win, though, because he came to the UFC with a record of 22-0, and and after losing to Zuba Takago, it, is, it appeared that his record was incredibly padded. But he's been beating some good fighters lately. Like, he has a win over Marlon Vera. He beat Henan Barral, even though we all know Barral isn't what he used to be. And now he just submitted Sergey Morozov after securing a KO in his fight prior. So that's pretty pretty cool to see. Um, Carlos Ulberg beat Fabio Chiron. Now, Chiron is somebody we all thought was really going to do well in the UFC. Like, everybody had high hopes for him. He came to the UFC with a 7-1 and one record. And he got submitted by Alonzo Menafield, knocked out by William Knight. And now he just got picked apart for three rounds by Carlos Olberg. He just, he's, he won the LFA light heavyweight belt before coming to the UFC by a five round unanimous decision. And that's pretty impressive because when you look at the dude, it doesn't look like he has the greatest card. He was a pretty stocky individual, but he just doesn't appear too comfortable in there. I haven't seen him in any of these three fights. He lost all three of them, but he didn't look comfortable in any three of them. So I would really love to see if he can fix his mentality. Maybe it's just UFC jitters. Maybe if he went to Bellator or PFL, he would do a little better. I don't know. But Carlos Olberg is a professional kickboxer, 19-2 and two professional kickboxer. And I love watching him fight. He's now 4-1 in MMA. I really can't wait to see what's next for him. Kyler Phillips had an incredible performance. Um, again, he did some things that, you know, kind of like Michelle Perheya just wastes his energy for things that he really doesn't need to, but it didn't affect him because his cardio was great. And he secured a triangle armbar on Marcelo Hojo in the third round after winning the first two. It was a really good fight. Um, kind of surprised he didn't get a performance of the night bonus for that, to be honest with you. Um, Casey O'Neill defeated Roxanne Modafferi, which I made a video on that if you'd like to see it. Andre Arlovsky, man, the career resurgence this guy has had is just remarkable to me. Okay, so he came back to the UFC with a record of 21 and 10. Mind you, he, there was a point in time where he'd been KO'd, like brutally KO'd, like four times in a row. We all thought he was done before he even came back to the UFC. Okay, he beats Brennan Shaw by a split decision, which most people thought he lost, but he was handed the win. And then he knocks out Antonio Silva and Travis Braun before beating Frank Mir. Like, 4-0 upon returning to the UFC. It was crazy. He then loses five straight fights, getting finished in four of them, before winning his next two and then going winless in his next four. So there are literally a number of times where we thought our loss deal was just done. You know, there's nothing left that he has to offer. Since then, which the most recent defeat was to Augusto Sakai, the split decision in April of 2019. Since then, he has gone six and two. 
He's on a three fight win streak. He's gone five and one in his last six, six and two in his last eight. It's crazy. He's not beating the very best in the world, but let's see. He beat Ben Rothwell. Then he got knocked out by Jairzinho Rosenstrike, who's a 76 and eight pro kickboxer. No shame in that. He then beat Felipe Leans, who is a PFL champion. He beat Tanner Bozer. He lost to Tom Aspinall. He wasn't looking that awfully bad in that fight, but he just, he really made a rookie mistake in it and he got submitted considering. Um, he then beat Chase Sherman, Carlos Felipe, which Carlos Felipe is a good fighter. He's a really good fighter. And then Jared Vandera, he's not beating the very best in the world, but dude, to see that he has had this kind of a resurgence multiple times throughout his career is just so cool. Like he's not finishing anybody anymore. There used to be a point where of his 24 wins, 17 of them were knockouts and only four decisions. He now has 13 decisions. That means his last nine wins are all decisions, but it doesn't matter. He's still winning these fights against maybe not the very best in the world, but very good fighters. Um, it's so, so cool to see. It really is. Bobby Green is another guy I want to mention to this because he has had a similar career resurgence. So he lost, he was one of the best in the world. And then he just started losing close decisions and he kind of, you know, lost his motivation and took a little, took a little break. Um, that was following his unanimous decision defeat to, to Dracar close, which I thought he won. He then came back and lost Francisco Trinaldo before beating Clay Guida, Lando Venata, and Alon Patrick in 2020. He finished off 2020 losing a unanimous decision to Tiago Moises, a fight I also thought he won. So in my opinion, he could have went 4-0 in 2020. Fast forward to the middle of 2021, where he fights Rafael, or Rafael Fazeev, rather, and loses another very close unanimous decision. Rafael Fazeev just beat the shit out of Brad Rydell, who's a 59-8 and eight pro kickboxer. I mean, Fazeev is 39-8 and eight himself in pro kickboxing. But for him to have done that to Brad Rydell and for Bobby Green to have given him that tough of a fight really says something. Um, Green returned last November to knock out Al Iaquinta. He did so so handily. First ever person to knock Al Iaquinta out. And then he followed that up with Owen over Nazareth Hackfrost at UFC 271. Now, he's going to be fighting Bobby Green this weekend on short note. Or he, Bobby Green is going to be fighting Islam Makhachev this weekend on short notice. But he's had such a remarkable career resurgence as well. And he and Andre Orlovsky fought in back-to-back -back fights at UFC 271. Hinato Moicano. Man, Alexander Hernandez isn't... Um, blossoming into quite what I thought he would, but he's getting tough fights, man. He's fighting such tough guys. And Honoro Moicano is now three and one at 155 pounds, all three wins by rear naked choke. Um, his one loss is to Rafael Fazeev by knockout. He got knocked out pretty badly in that fight, but he sends one, two straight. Jared Cannonier and Derek Brunson. Now I thought Cannonier was going to knock Brunson out. But after that first round, I was a little skeptical of it. And here's something that I've noticed throughout Derek Brunson's career is that he gets discouraged in the middle of his fights, even the ones he's winning. And it's not like he has an easy job because he doesn't. He literally has the hardest job in the world. Not, not just as a fighter, but he's literally fighting the best fighters in the world. He has the hardest job in the world. Um, but he won that first round handily, handily. And in the second round, his, his demeanor just was not the same. It's weird because he didn't get stuffed on a lot of takedowns or anything, you know. Maybe he could have had a, the same second round and then third as he did the first. But Cannoneer's cardio is very good. He didn't get tired out from uh, being on the bottom. And after a dominant first round for Brunson, as I mentioned, in the second round, his confidence just wasn't the same. And he got brutally knocked out considering – Tai Tuivasa and Derek Lewis. Oh my God, Tai Tuivasa is so fucking tough. This dude is so durable. Like, how do you take those shots from Derek Lewis? He wasn't even looking at him. He was down, like, almost in bottom turtle position up along the cage. And Lewis is just raining down heavy shots. He landed three or four of his hardest shots to a Tuivasa that wasn't even looking at him. 
and two of Hossett gets back to his feet and then makes it through the first round and then knocks him out in the second round. It's fucking remarkable. I don't think we've ever seen that happen to Derek Lewis before. Like, we've seen him get finished with strikes. We've never seen him unconscious. Like, that is truly remarkable to me. Um, actually, that's not true. Matt Mitrione, I'm pretty sure, knocked him off. That was a long time ago, though. And, yeah, dude, two of us, I've said it for a hot minute now. Even when he was on that three-fight losing streak, this dude is a future champion. Probably in the UFC, man, he's so talented. He didn't even start training regularly until he fought, till right before he fought Stefan Struve. Like, to have those kind of performances and not even have a regular training regiment, like, that just goes to speak to his potential. Now that he's actually training, five-fight win streak, all knockouts. Israel Adesanya and Robert Whitaker. My stream took a shit right in the middle of this fight, which really sucks because I was supposed to cover it too. But the first two rounds, I saw Israel pick Whitaker apart. He dropped him in the first round. And then Whitaker <clears throat> was able to secure some uh, takedowns throughout the rest of it and make it a much closer fight. Some people think Whitaker won. Some people think Israel won. It's really unfortunate. I'm going to have to go back and watch that one. Um. But I will say, Israel Adesanya, he is someone that evolved so rapidly. So, so, so rapidly. Like, he evolved quicker than anybody we knew. And then, like, recently, it's kind of like he's stagnated a little bit. Like, it's like, it's almost like his evolution has come to a halt. And I really hope that's not the case. But I guess time will tell, right? Mario Batista had a really, really good performance. He and Jay Perrin um, put on a hell of a show at UFC Vegas 48 to open up the prelims. Um, let's see. Cass Skelly had a really good performance uh, coming back after a couple years away, and he retired after a second round TKO. So that was good to see. It sucks I won't see him fight anymore, but that's a really good one to go out on. Stephanie Egger. Man, I was so upset about this. It's not that I don't like Stephanie, but I really love Jessica Rose Clark. And Eggers' jiu-jitsu is beautiful because that arm bar she pulled off was just insane. It was it was so gorgeous. Um, Egger, Egger is now seven and two as a professional, um, with two and one in the UFC with two finishes. David Onama and Gabriel Benitez, no. I've been waiting for David Onama's next fight ever since he fought Mason Jones. And his fight with Gabriel Benitez, man, it was really good. Benitez was starting to pick him apart a little bit early on in the fight. And then toward the end of the first round, Onama ends up landing such a vicious, like, 10, 12-punch combination that brutally starches Benitez at 424 of the round. And I've been saying it ever since before he fought Mason Jones, this kid might be the next big thing. Because he fought Mason Jones a weight class above. He's a natural featherweight. He fought Jones at 55. Jones is a cage warriors champ champ at 155 and 170. A lot of people think Onama won that fight. Like, it was a very close fight. And he's now 9-1 and one with nine finishes. I can't wait to see what's next for him, man. His potential is, like, forget the sky. There is no limit. Joaquin Buckley and Abdul Razak Hassan. No, this was... A pretty good fight, too. No, I was pretty impressed with Al Hassan, to be honest with you, because I did not expect him to come together in the third round the way he did. He has not shown the greatest cardio um, throughout his career. All he's not 11 and five. He came into the fight 11 and four. All four or all 11 of those wins, rather, were first round knockouts, most of them done in brutal fashion. Um, this could have been the first time that he won a fight that went outside the third round. It was a very close fight. Um, I scored the first two rounds for Buckley and then the third for Alhassan. I could see you giving the first and third to Alhassan and the second to Buckley, but it was a close fight. I almost wish Alhassan got the nod because it would help his confidence a little bit. It would help him really know that he can go three rounds, even though now he does. A win would have helped that a little more. Um, Alhassan's 36 years old. I, just, I don't want to see him retire. I want to see him fight a lot more. Jim Miller versus Nicholas Moda. No, I feel so bad for Nicholas Moda. Like, why in the fuck would you give someone 
who hasn't fought in nearly two years that is making their UFC debut, why would you have him fight someone that has the most fights in UFC history and the most wins in UFC? Well, at the time, he had the second most wins in UFC history. Now he has the most wins in UFC history. Why would you give someone who's making their UFC debut someone like that? Like, he could have fought a few different guys in the top 15 that probably would have been easier fights. Like, Jim Miller isn't a top 15 guy anymore, but, dude, he's more experienced than literally anybody in the sport. And, yeah, Moda, Moda hurt him. He hurt him in the first round. But then Miller hurt him and finished him in the second. That's Miller's third straight win, I think, and it's a second straight knockout win. Oh, no, it's a second straight win, but it's a second straight win via knockout. He just got his first standing knockout victory of his career in his last fight, and now he knocks out a really tough Brazilian who a lot of people don't know who Moda is, but he's got some good wins. Like, he's a former champion. He knocked out Joe Selecki um, a while back, and Joe Selecki is doing very well in the UFC right now. Selecki is actually the last guy to beat Jim Miller. Uh, Parker Porter and Alan Bodot. Now, Alan Bodot is by far the more crisp striker. He's by far the superior striker. But Porter just wouldn't be denied, man. He ate so many shots, but he just kept moving forward and taking them. Like, it's so crazy the career surgeon port career resurgence Porter has had as well. Because this guy fought John Jones back in 2008. Okay. Like, it's pretty crazy. He fought Gabriel Gonzaga a while back. He's fought some good fighters. Nonetheless, he made his UFC debut with a record of 9-5 and five in August of 2020. After getting knocked out by Chris Dawkins, like a fight he just got mauled in, he has since won three straight, the first of which over Josh Parisian, who was very highly touted um, at the time. Like a lot of people thought, expected big things of uh, Josh Parisian. And Porter just mauled him, as well as Chase Sherman, and now as well as Alan Bodot, after falling to nine and six in your UFC debut to winning your next three straight. And really, it was a similar performance in all three of these fights. Just a gritty, I will not be denied, I am going to beat you kind of mentality. And it's so admirable. It really is. Parker Porter, you have my respect, man. Like, seriously. It's been really cool to see what you've done recently. It really is, especially at, what, 36 years old, almost 37. He'll be 37 in two months. It's really cool to see. Kyle Dawkins submitted Jamie Pickett at the end of the first round, which I think a lot of people could have expected. Um, Pickett had done pretty well recently, too. He had beaten Lorraine Staropoli and Joseph Holmes, which most people don't know who Holmes is, but he's a pretty good prospect. He's like a middleweight Jamal Hill, I think, just not quite as evolved yet. Um, after losing his first two fights in the UFC, he then won those two before being submitted by Dawkins. And Dawkins, man, he's a lot different than Chris Dawkins, his brother. Chris, they're both Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belts. Chris is more of a boxer, and Kyle's more of a submission grappler. And... His last fight was against Kevin Holland, which obviously ended in controversy, but he was beating the shit out of Kevin Holland that whole time. So I'm, I'm really excited to see what Kyle Dawkins has next. And then the main event, Jamal Hill versus Johnny Walker. Now, it looked like Walker was doing really well. He wasn't trying to land the most devastating strikes. He was trying to find his timing, find his range, pick – hill apart and it was working early on with his variety of kicks he started out with his front snap kick and then you know went for leg kicks of a couple sorts you know inside outside leg kick and then switched it to head kicks and he was doing pretty well with it you know being someone that's six six at 205 pounds um it was working out pretty well for him and hill i wouldn't say he was beginning to look a little frustrated because i would i wouldn't say that but he was getting picked apart a little bit early on, and he was trying to find his range. But when he found his range, he found it, and it only took one strike. That hard overhand landed right on Walker's temple and is one of the strangest knockouts we will ever see. Like, he was out before he hit the ground. It was beautiful. Jamal Hill, ladies and gents, is a serious, serious talent. 
He's now 10 and one. His only loss is to Paul Craig by submission, which Paul Craig submits everybody that he doesn't get knocked out by. And yeah, he's now on a two fight win streak with first round KOs over Jimmy Crew and Johnny Walker. That's incredibly impressive for someone that has 12 fights to be that good already. It's not unheard of, but it's very, very, very impressive. I can't wait to see what's next for him. So as far as Bellator goes, Aviv Gozali was handed his first defeat in an upset to Bobby King, um, a fight he got injured in and couldn't, you know, answer the bell for the second round. Um, he'll be back. That kid's a prodigy. Andre Koreshkov put on one of the most devastating early knockout performances you could have. Um, Chance Hencontre, he is a UFC vet. Andre Koreshkov now has 15 wins inside the Bellator, the Bellator circle, which only a few fighters have. And this spin and back kick, it's not his first spin and back kick knockout, but man, he broke five of Chance's ribs and punctured his lung with it and finished the fight in 38 seconds. Like Andre Koreshkov is such a wickedly dangerous striker. Like, does anybody remember his fight with Ben Henderson? Like, man. How tough is Ben Henderson? Because he ate shots like that, that whole five rounds. Like, man, it was brutal. And then Logan Storley defeated Neiman Gracie via five round unanimous decision, which I think a lot of people expected Gracie to win that. Logan Storley is very good. He's the only person that's given Yaroslav Amosov a fight. He lost a split decision to Yaroslav, and honestly, he could have won that fight. It was very, very, very close. All right, let's fast forward to Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship. So Chad Mendes made his Bare Knuckle Fighting debut um, a couple of years following his retirement from MMA. Now, he left the sport of MMA a couple of times. Um, I was so happy when he came back, but he only went one and one, and then he retired again. But it is so cool to see someone like him going to Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship because he was always – well, not always. Since he got knocked out by Jose Aldo in their first fight, he really started to work on his striking. He went into that fight 11-0. Seven of his wins were decisions. Following that, he secured four straight knockout wins. Okay? And his striking has been vicious ever since. He hits so goddamn hard. He's so fast. His shot selection's pretty good. He's kind of like a mini Mike Tyson. Kind of. Um, and he knocked out Fames in round four after dropping him five times. He had such a wicked performance. Like, it was so, so, so cool to see. Um, and then Mike Perry versus Julian Lane, that fight lived up to every bit of it we thought it would. Mike Perry catches Lane with a vicious overhand, right, and hurts him badly in the first round. Like, Lane was really on Queer Street there for a minute. Like, his eyes did not – like, he wasn't with it. But he survived. And even in the second round, it didn't look like he was fully recovered. So he gets outboxed for a couple more rounds. And then, like, toward the end of the fourth round, he starts to come alive and lands some really nice combinations on Perry, who just eats it and keeps walking forward. And then the fifth round, Lane wins as well. So it looked like a fight that someone was definitely walking away with. And then Lane came back and made it close at the end. It was such a great fight. I would love to see a rematch between the two, honestly. But then again, I'd like to see Mike Perry fight someone else too. Like there's a lot of, I don't even know all the guys that are in KFC and all. Like combat sports is so hard to pay attention to with all these events. But there are so many, like it was, it was exciting seeing MMA guys go to it to begin with. But now that I feel like the right MMA guys are going to it, like Chad Mendes, like Mike Perry, like, Jorge Masvidal would be sick to do this like it would it's so cool to see and I really can't wait to see what's next for either of them Mike Perry has since since leaving the UFC which he went from 11 and 1 to 14 and 8 that's 3 and 7 in his last 10 UFC fights he's since gone 2 and 0 since leaving the UFC it's fucking remarkable beating a 25 and 3 pro boxer in a boxing match in one of them it's, you know, a mixed rules boxing match, but it's still nonetheless very impressive. So, now we gear up for Makachev versus Green, and uh, I'll break that card down. Thank you all for watching, and see you next time.